past few years, we've, we've elected to uh, put a uh, uh, weather person or climatologist, whatever you want to call them, somebody on here that maybe can give us a little bit of insight into what's going to occur over the, uh, the next um, several months. Uh, three years ago, in the drought of 2011, the uh, climatologist we had, uh, well, she was here about five years before that, and she was right on. Uh, in 2011, she came, and it was doom and gloom. Man, the drought was going to continue. It was going to be dry through the fall and the spring, and, uh, and, and every other weather person. Uh, even the one we're going to have speaking was kind of predicting it's, it's not going to be good. And uh, believe me, we were so excited when she was wrong for the big, biggest portion of the state. Uh, because it did start raining for a good portion of Texas and things turned around a little bit. Uh, now we're in portions of the state, we've kind of got sporadic rainfall and, and it seems like uh, there's some dry areas and some that are wet and some that are not so wet and it's just all over the board depending on the location that you're in. So our next speaker in line is going to give us a little bit of insight on what we can uh, maybe expect and look at some weather patterns and some things over the next year or so to help us make some decisions on what we should do. Uh, we had him on last year, Mr. Brian Bledsoe. He's Chief Meteorologist and Climatologist at KKTV 11 News in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, he grew up, and this is the reason I like him, uh, he grew up on a ranch. And, it, and looking at his bio, it says, weather caught his eye at a very early age. I think when you live on a ranch and grow up on a ranch, you are in the weather because uh, if it's not raining, mom and daddy are complaining about it. Uh, and if it's raining, they're all happy, which means that it's a good day for you too. So he, he started early understanding weather and meteorology and he wanted to give it a try. And uh, so he went on to school, uh, got a degree from University of Northern Carolina, or Colorado, and, uh, and he's really continued with that ranching and, and agricultural side because he understands the importance that weather plays in farmers and ranchers' lives and their business. They depend on it. And, uh, and so he has that understanding, and he does a great job, and we uh, want to welcome Mr. Brian Bledsoe again. Let's give him a round of applause. How's everybody doing today? Is it warm enough for everybody? I would hope so. I left 58 degrees in rain to come down here to South Texas in August. A little bit of different weather down here for me. Um, this picture right here, or two pictures that I have for you, uh, happened on the same day, 80 miles apart from each other in my backyard. This one happened down near La Hunta, Colorado. It's probably the 30, 40 some odd duster we've had up in that way. Uh, they started in January up there. This happened 15 miles west of my house up on Highway 24, Colorado Springs, west of Woodland Park. Anybody been up that way? A few of you? Half inch of rain in 15 minutes did this. We've had two major fires up that way over the past two years. We've lost 900 homes because of the drought that's going on in Colorado. Third worst drought in history going on right now. So this is what we've been dealing with. This is where we are right now. It finally started raining in July. And while I'm very happy to see that rain, uh, my afternoons have been a complete disaster from a television side of it. Because when it's doing this, we've got reporters and everybody up Highway 24 uh, being looky-loos to see how things are going. So my main focus here today is, is, is this information valuable? Is this information valuable not only to just the general person, but uh, I can guarantee you that if you're a farmer or a rancher and you knew that this uh, left-hand side picture was coming at you uh, 12 months ahead of time, would that be valuable to you all? I would say so. That's the biggest reason why I'm doing what I'm doing and trying to educate and get as much outreach out there as I can so people in the agricultural field have the information and the sound information that they can utilize to help make better decisions. I'll give you an example of that. My folks farm and ranch, uh, very dry land. Uh, it's the worst drought I've ever seen. Even when it did start raining, nothing came back. Grass is dead, pastures are gray. And uh, last October, it was even before October, we had a meeting actually in August, and I was asked if, uh, if they were gonna get enough moisture to plant wheat. 
And I said, well, how much do you need? He said, we need about an inch of moisture. I said, you're going to get an inch of moisture by uh, end of September. September 26th, they got a half inch of rain. September 27th, they got a half inch of rain. There's nothing like cutting it close, is there? <laughs> so, uh, but I took that a step further. I said, you can plant that wheat, but I said, don't plan on cutting it. What do you mean? You're not going to get any moisture. So in the world that we live in, you can make money off of a drought. You can make a lot of money off a of drought. I told them, dust that wheat in the ground and ensure the heck out of it against drought. Smart? Absolutely. They made more money off of that insurance than they would have cutting that wheat crop. A lot of people did that last year. Um, it's just a small example of what we can do. Are we always right? <laughs> no. But it's not about always being right to the T. It's about providing a roadmap that you can use to help plan your future. There are days that are just not going to work out as far as weather forecasting is concerned, and that's what weather, uh, being in the weather business is all about. But somebody's got to do it, so I figured it might as well be me. So I'm going to share a lot of information with you today. Uh, I'm at the Southern Livestock uh, Standard booth. Uh, after we get done here, feel free to come by and take questions. I also have my website right here. Feel free to frequent it. I do regional forecasts for uh, basically the Western High Plains, uh, Texas included, uh, in that. So feel free to check some of that stuff out. We got to look back before we can look ahead. So last year at this time when I was here speaking, uh, we were looking at ocean temperatures right here, sea surface temperature anomalies. Uh, those of, the, of you that are familiar with the El Nino and La Nina uh, stuff, this is the area in the Pacific Ocean that we look at to track that. And last uh, year at this time, that green and yellow shaded water, but that's warmer than normal water. It actually looked like we were going to have a little bit of an El Nino come through and help things out just a little bit. Well, that really didn't happen a whole lot. Uh, and this is where we are today, almost a year later. Well, those temperatures look a little different, don't they? By quite a bit. In fact, all of this is cooler than normal water right here. Nothing extreme, you know, there's nothing extreme about it, but you're talking about a five degree Celsius change in this amount of water? You do the math, that's a lot of heat exchange that's going on out there, and it has a huge impact on the weather patterns. Not just here, not just in Colorado, all over the world. Okay? When these oceans blink, uh, it has some pretty big ramifications. So uh, basically, I'm going to tell you where we're headed by using those temperatures. Okay? This is temperature and precipitation departure from normal during the last 30 and 90 days. So over here on the 30-day side, remember that weirdo storm that came from West Virginia and moved right across Texas? Yeah, came from West Virginia and moved all the way to southern Arizona. That's a little weird for July, wouldn't you say? Just a little bit. But if you were in that line, look what it did to central Texas. Anybody get four to six inches of rain out of this? Anybody get a half inch out of this? Yep. I'll tell you what, there's been one word down here since I've been talking that's been coming up uh, about every 10 minutes when I'm talking about rain, and that's the word spotty. I think spotty pretty much shows, the, shows what we've been dealing with. Uh, but again, it did rain, where if you got in some of that rain, you're looking in pretty good shape. 90 days, where you see it all white, yeah, it's about normal, but there are some dry spots. Southeast Texas, South Texas, also parts of the Panhandle have been absolutely rotten, you know, for months. Temperature-wise, again, kind of a tale of two different sides. We've been real warm here in the west, we've been pretty cool in the east. You guys had a pretty cool spring, didn't you? Yeah, we froze wheat uh, in eastern Colorado and western Kansas in late May up there. Yeah, we, we had a pretty short growing season when it came to that. So what the drought didn't get, the freeze got. There wasn't much wheat cut in southern Colorado this year, that's for sure. This is the drought monitor. I know most of you are familiar with that. This is exactly where we were last July. All that red is a whole lot of badness. But look here in East Texas, Central Texas. Things weren't horrendous. We were recovering. This is where we are now. Worst drought I've ever seen in Southeast Colorado. 
until it started raining. Awful conditions, even worse in southwest Kansas. Northeast New Mexico's finally started to get some rain. But look at it starting to dry out again here. And what we've got going on outside right now sure isn't helping the drought situation. It's doing nothing but bake the ground. Corn Belt, get a load of that. That's one of the biggest things down here. The biggest difference this year up here in the Corn Belt. What was corn priced at last year at this time? Nine bucks? It's 486 today. Think the weather has something to do with that? I think it has a lot to do with that. Not only that, if things go where, where they're going, it'll be a record corn crop that'll be cut. If it doesn't get frozen. Yeah. They frosted corn in North Dakota a week and a half ago. Got down to 34 degrees up there in some places in July. Yeah. Am I saying there's going to be a freeze up that way? Nope. But if I was a corn farmer up there, I'd be a little bit concerned uh, because if they had such a long, cold, wet spring and the heat of the summer up there has been non-existent. They've been cold and wet for a while. Uh, but I'd be concerned if I was up there. Down here in Texas, people just want to know if it's going to rain. Persistent drought due to oceanic oscillations. AMO, PDO, in a phase similar to what occurred in the 50s. I've said this a lot. If you read our, my uh, Southern Livestock Standard article, you know I've been talking about this thing for years. The Pacific and the Atlantic have these oscillations that really mess with our weather. And I'm not talking about on a yearly basis, but I'm talking about on a decade type basis. They fluctuate about every 25 to 35 years. And when they fluctuate, it dramatically impacts our weather. So what I've got up here is the Atlantic up here on the top, Pacific on the bottom, where you see the blue bars here, that's when the ocean's cold. Where you see the red bars, that's when the ocean was warm. Over here to current times, Atlantic is warm, Pacific is cold. What does that look like? You know, it's a, it's a head scratcher, isn't it, when people say, you know, it's the hottest we've seen since the 50s. We're breaking records set in 1954. Isn't that what the network media likes to say? We haven't seen storms like this in forever. We haven't seen drought like this in forever. Fact is, network media doesn't have very good memory. Neither do the people that are working for them. You go back into the 50s, this pattern that we are seeing fits to a T. McCabe, back in 2004, came out with this amazingly helpful map. If you are in the agriculture industry, you need to know this map, period. What we've done here is mapped out the different phases of the ocean. This is the phase we're in right now. Pacific, PDO, is cold, negative. AMO is warm. All of this red is higher than normal drought frequency. If you could take the drought monitor and smack it right on this wall and overlay it, that's what the drought monitor looks like right now. Southwest third of the country is struggling and has been struggling for years. Some people say all the way back to 2000 or even before they've been struggling. Again, this isn't a perfect road map, but it gives you a real good idea. What do you think these fellers up here in the Corn Belt dealt with last year? They're not seeing it this year, but they sure did last year. Where are we going? We're going to this phase over here on the left. When are we going? Four to nine years? Five to ten? Ballpark? It's not an exact science, but for those of you, who's a rancher in here under the age of 30? A few of you, don't be shy, because when I go speak to these young ranchers and farmers, I tell them one thing. If you're in the agricultural business, you're taking over daddy's ranch or farm or whatever, you better have a drought plan. Because for the next something years, we are going to see more dry years than wet years. That's just the way it's going to be. And for my family and myself up here in Colorado, it's out of the frying pan and into the fire, where you see that red bullseye. Up in the panhandle country. Panhandle country's been rotten now for, for the several months. Again, out of the frying pan, into the fire. But look at this. Where you see that blue shade, that's where the drought frequency lowers by quite a bit. This drought bullseye eventually will move farther north. It doesn't help me, it helps you, it helps you guys. Very important. Are we gonna see any type of El Nino or La Nina? Let's look at it. 
This particular computer model right here, where you see this line kind of going along right here, and then you get the dashed line with all the spaghetti lines out here, that's the computer model s suggesting where we're going to go. When this dashed line gets up here about 0.5 or above, that's where we're in El Nino conditions, usually pretty beneficial to Texas in the winter and the spring. Where this dashed line gets down here about minus 5, that's La Nina. No bueno, for sure. So if you draw the line out, it basically says the model's like, eh, not El Nino, not La Nina, just kind of La Nada, okay? Right there in between. This particular one, this is uh, run out of uh, Europe, very good model. But right now, it's forecasting these lines up here to go almost El Nino status by fall and into the early winter. I'm not really sold on this. I don't think that's going to happen. This one's run out of Australia. I'll tell you what, the Aussies do one thing very well, and that is talk about El Nino and La Nina. They are the pioneers as far as the forecasting, those are concerned. And they do a very good job, and so do their computer models. So this model right here, where you see this dashed blue line, that would be La Nina territory. This up here would be El Nino territory. And again, it kind of keeps it right in between. But notice the tendencies here. The trend is your friend. Right here is where we are. Basically neutral to slight, slight La Nina right now. And we kind of meander around that way all the way through winter. But look at some of these lines down here. Some of these lines down here suggest we could stay kind of borderline La Nina right through most of winter and then come out of it as we head into spring. This is basically the one I'm going with because history suggests this is the pattern we should probably see. And so when you get a computer model that recognizes that trend, it's usually a pretty good one to use. This one's run out of Japan. Looks like a mess, doesn't it? Big mess. When you see these lines all over the place like this, that usually means that model had no idea what's going to happen. However, you have to look through some of the chaos for some important information. How many of these lines are above zero toward El Nino? Not many. Most of them are down here in badness territory, and then eventually pull it up out of here toward the spring. So you remember when Texas got wet back in uh, 2012, coming out of that awful drought. So what caused that? We came out of a La Nina and went to an El Nino. It's the transition between the two that really excites the storm track. And it really excites the storm track in good locations, those locations that have been dry, all right? So as far as the overall trend is concerned, I'm really not that excited about seeing a, uh, a come out of this weak La Nina or this La Nada status toward an El Nino in the near term. But I am more excited about that happening as we head toward the spring. Let's look at the computer model forecast. Up here, September, October, November. This is the general forecast uh, for that time. And again, it's a three-month forecast. It's 90 days. So uh, could September have some moisture in it? It's possible. But I think what the model is suggesting here is that because of the, the weather pattern that we're dealing with right now, the things are going to be pretty status quo. And that isn't necessarily a good thing, especially as dry as things have been around here lately. But there's no tremendous dry signal. You've got a little bit here where you see the orange shading in East Texas. Uh, you're still pretty wet here in Western Colorado and you're still wet up here over the Great Lakes. But at least through August, uh, you know, the prospects for seeing significant rain, unless we can get a big tropical storm here in the Gulf, uh, the uh, prospects for rain, at least in Texas, are, are not looking great uh, at this time. Big old high about right here, and that monsoon moisture is doing like this, doing nothing but a pinwheel around Texas. November, December, January. Dry signal here across most of Texas. Um, I think that's due to the La Nada slash La, weak La Nina type status that kind of keeps things a little bit drier here. Um, ironically enough, you guys here in Texas are really the only one that shows a strong dry signal. Everybody else seems to be in pretty good shape. But again, it isn't strong like I've seen around lately uh, with some of these droughts that have been happening. Uh, but still, 
you know, it's something to be at least a little bit concerned about. January, February, March. You remember that little transition thing that I was talking about, where we come out of that weak La Nina and we head toward El Nino status. That time is the time that I need to really focus on as a forecaster, and you guys do as a producer, to really capitalize on when that moisture is going to occur. Right now, it appears that that transition would happen as we head into spring. And I think the model is doing a somewhat of a decent job in recognizing that with putting a slight wetter than normal signal right there across southern Oklahoma and into Texas. Um, out here in California, it's dry, wet conditions right up here, okay, across the, uh, the uh, Pacific coast. But other than that, you know, things are not looking too horrendous across most of the area, um, area being the United States. This model right here is run out of Japan. And again, that looks like a mess. You'd think they'd clean stuff up at least a little bit. Uh, but all you need to know is where you have the brown and the slight red, that's where it's drier than normal. Where you see the green, that's where the model's forecasting wet. So up here in Texas, again, this is uh, where my, uh, September, October, November. You got a little bit of a dry signal here across central west Texas. Again, nothing terrible, all right? This is December, January, February. A little bit of a dry signal here across New Mexico and West Texas. Look where it's wet. See that slight green here? Dakotas, up here through the Midwest. In this particular pattern, the storm track does something like this, okay? Which would obviously miss, you know, Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, and have the bigger storms set up farther to the east, which is why here in far east Texas, that model is picking out at least a little bit of a chance for some rain or snow, depending on how cold it gets. And then here we go. Pretty consistent with the March, April, May. Colorado, Four Corners area, slightly drier, but look at Texas. Most of it is in that slight green area. And again, I think that's the model recognizing that transition. All right? So from a, from a planning standpoint, um, that's the general trend that I like, and I, it looks like I'm going to go with as far as an overall forecast is concerned. So breaking down Texas over here in the regions, drier and warmer than normal fall, early winter. That's what I would plan for. That's what I've told my folks to plan for as far as uh, planning purposes are concerned. Uh, I think some of the driest places during this time are probably going to be up here in region one and region two, all right, for the panhandle region and probably some folks down here in West Texas as well. Colder and possibly wetter than normal late spring and winter, or uh, late winter and spring, I should say. Region one and two question mark. Uh, we could very well have wetter than normal conditions in this whole area here, but maybe skip out on region one and two. A little bit different area up here when it comes to the weather patterns that we're dealing with. It takes a little bit more to help to break the drought and shift those weather patterns around. Uh, so I'd be a little bit cautious about bringing in a lot of moisture during this time if you're up here in one and two. And then the El Nino for late 2014. I think there's at least an above average chance that that's a possibility. All right. My breakdown. Weak La Nina likely for fall and early winter. Even if it isn't a weak La Nina, it's probably going to be right there close. All right. Usually means drier than normal for the southern plains. And that's history speaking. That's no computer model. That's just sheer history. Transition from weak La Nina to weak El Nino, possible during the spring, which would make for possible wetter conditions, along with cooler than normal. If weak El Nino materializes for the spring, this would likely make for a drying and warming trend for you guys here in Texas, going in out of spring and into summer. All right, I would plan kind of accordingly for that with the heat and the dry coming back to summer. That could bring back some of the drought if we don't fix some of that for the spring during that transition. So that's a very important time. The models are really all over the place regarding what will happen in the next six to 12 months. So you try to have to look through some of that minutia to really get the pattern figured out. But there are some consistencies which I've mentioned today. Lower than normal confidence in the forecast beyond spring of 2014 because of this. The models are really no help beyond that time. You have to really focus on what's gonna happen over the next say three months or so to go forward. And remember, we're still reliving those 1950s drought patterns with periodic breaks. 